Let's get started today. I'm excited about our message. Uh, we've got an illustrated message. The last illustrated message we did was on Easter of 2020. <laughs> Remember that year? We were, we were, uh, the plan was uh, early in like February to do that illustrated message in April. Had no idea we were going to do it to an empty room. It was just a camera sitting right there about where Brant's sitting. And there was a camera there and that was it. But I uh, appreciate uh, Ben Jackson, Ron Duke coming and helping me uh, with that illustrated message. Remember they, they were making something and, and it ended up being a what? Y'all are paying attention two years ago, and you can remember that. That's amazing. Great. They were making a table. So today we've got an illustrated message. Let's get going, all right? We have uh, come to a season, I believe, of victory. 2022 is going to be a year of greatness and a year of victory. We are coming out of and into. We're always coming out of something and into something, and we're always in the middle of that transition. But um, the difficulties uh, which some face were physical. Uh, others faced in these last couple of years uh, difficulties that were more emotional. Some were relational. Uh, and some were just decision difficulties. There was just a constant array and movement of decision making. You'd make a plan. We're going to have life groups. Oh, no, we're not. Because nobody's getting together. Nobody wants to be anywhere near each other. Well, we wanted to be, but we realized we needed to be separated. It was difficult these last couple of years, but we made it through. Amen? Amen. And I'm glad. And so we're moving on into something great. Jesus promised us that we would be tested in what we believe and in what we do. He tests us so that our resolve can become apparent. God is not ignorant of what is in our lives and in our hearts, but sometimes the test brings out what is in our heart. That's what the Bible tells us. That the test that we go through, the difficulties that we come to, the hardships, anything that is that difficulty or abnormal, something that we weren't asking for or really planning for, is God's way of testing us to show us what is in our life and in our hearts. Sometimes we like what is in our heart, and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we go, whoa, where'd that come from? And God says, your heart. That's where it came from. So let's work on that a little bit. But the test that God gives us is always good. It always has a reason and a purpose. The test reveals three things. Do I know the subject? Or have I mastered the skill? Or am I resilient in spite of the struggle? Am I resilient in spite of the struggle. You have your Bibles? Please turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 9. We're going to read a section of Scripture out of Luke, chapter 9. That's going to be our focus today. We're going to talk about God's grace to keep us resilient. He wants us to be resilient. He wants us to be resolute. He wants us to endure so that we can overcome. And so that uh, and as we get older and older, we go through tests. It reveals what is in our heart. Everyone loves to take a test when you're prepared. No one likes to take a test when you're not prepared. And so God says, I want you to be prepared for everything that happens. These last couple of years have prepared us in ways we weren't ready for, but we, res we, but we come into this year stronger than we've ever been. Can I just say this? You are stronger than you've ever been. You are smarter than you've ever been. You are wiser than you've ever been. You are better than you've ever been because of what you've been through, because of the test in your life. Well, we're in Luke chapter number 9. We're going to start reading at verse number 51. As the time approached for him, Jesus, to be taken up into heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. 
When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? Hmm. But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. And as they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And he said to another man, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom. Hey, let's pray. Uh, Father, your word is powerful, it is true, it is relevant for today. Lord, your word is a light to our path. It shows us the way, and your word inside of our life changes us. Help us, Father, to be more resolute, to live a life that is so resilient that the difficulties and trials and struggles only make us better. By your grace, in Jesus' name, amen? Amen. God blesses all of his children with gifts and with purpose. Every person here today who is a follower of Jesus Christ has purpose. And you have gift, a gift or gifts in which we use to fulfill our purpose. We're going to use an illustration today, and Josh Payne has said he would help me. So Josh is going to get ready. I think you guys, if you've seen the target up here and what we've got established over here, uh, know what we're going to do. Now, I just want to let you know Josh has never even touched a bow and arrow. No, I'm just kidding. That's not true. That is not true. We're going to have some fun here today. And uh, Josh is going to show us what it means to really focus and concentrate on a target using his gift. Yes and amen. And so, Josh, uh, give us a whirl, man. Show us, uh, show us what, 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 now, which one are you aiming for? Which, which red, which red dot? The TV. The t- <laughs> There's not a red dot. Do not put a red dot up there on that TV. I'll go for the big one. Okay. All right. Wow. Woo. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's see if you can do it again. Or you can aim for a different one, but, you know. Okay. Aim for the center. Okay. Here we go. Okay, but he hit the target. Yeah, see? But he hit the target. That's good. Now, what if there was some distraction for Josh? Okay, hit the target, okay? Now, what if the distractions ramped up a bit? All right. You ain't got this one. No, you can't. No, there's no way. No, not a single bit. Let's see if it ramps up even more. All right. Yeah, I think he's doing pretty good. What do you think? Okay, I think the youth are doing pretty good too. All right. But what if we really ramped it up? What would happen if? 
Oh, yeah, here we go. Do it again. All right. Way to go, man. Well, that's pretty good. I mean, he's... He's got five or six, like, right tight. That's, that's great. Hey, let's give Josh and all these guys a hand. Way to go. <laughs> Distractions are a reality in life, the struggles, the difficulties, all the things that happen that try to get us off track of our purpose. They try and rob us of our joy, our gifts, the grace of God, the knowledge of God, and the help of our friends. Those distractions and trials and difficulties are always trying to get us to look somewhere else, think somewhere else, be somewhere else. And yet, God's called us to stay focused, to stay focused on the purpose that he has given us and use the gifts that he's given us. And let's face it, I would imagine that I'm in good company because I know I in my own life have become distracted at different times and gotten sidetracked onto something else, but it is the grace of God that pulls me back into alignment and says, no, I've called you to do this. This is your purpose and the gifts. How many of you have had experienced that in your life? Sure, and, but, but God's grace pulls us back. We find here in Luke chapter number nine that Jesus addresses three different men and three different distractions. One is convenience. He turns to the man and he says, hey, foxes don't have, uh, you know, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, he's saying, you say you're going to follow me, but you could easily become distracted with a lack of convenience. Can you handle that? And sometimes God pulls away the conveniences of life so that we have to deal with the real issues. Am I going to serve God even though it's not comfortable right now? Some of us have experienced that. He dealt with the next guy about consideration, the priority. He says, hey, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to follow you, but I first want to go bury my father. And it on the surface level, we might think, well, Jesus was pretty insensitive. This guy's wanting to bury his father. And certainly in the whole framework and, and, and scope of what Christianity is all about and the God from Genesis to Revelation, we understand that God is very pro-family. He's not against family or taking care of your family. But what he was doing was saying there is a consideration of priorities. And he's not saying that, that serving your family is bad. He's saying God is more important than your family. Is your family important? Yes. Love your family. Care for your family. Invest in your family. Uh, do everything you can for your family. But God is number one. The third would be that of being critical. He's saying, okay, yeah, you say you want to serve me, but you've got to go say goodbye to your family. He says, don't look back. There are critical issues, and that is the kingdom. The critical issue is there are people who will spend eternity in heaven with God in his joy and his love, and there are people who will spend eternity in complete separation from God. That is the critical issue. Your family is important, and saying hi and bye to your family is important, but the critical issue is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ with the gift God's given you, aiming toward the purpose that he's given you. The disciples were distracted by the Samaritans' offense. The Samaritans didn't receive Jesus. They were like, hey, man, no, he's going on Jerusalem. I don't know all that they did, but the Bible says they didn't receive it. And the disciples got offended. How many times have we been tempted to become distracted from our purpose because of someone's offense? And it doesn't even have to be an offense about us. They were distracted because the people didn't like Jesus. How many times have you seen someone get, dis get offended over somebody else's offense? And that's what happened with the disciples. They've been, they've been following Jesus for about three years at this point. I mean, they've learned a lot. They've grown a lot. But yet they're still having struggles just like you and me. And so they were, dis they were distracted because the Samaritans were offended 
at Jesus. Jesus was not distracted by anything. But why? Because he was focused on his purpose. He knew why he came. He began to preach immediately. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. He said, the Son of Man did not come to, to, to build a big building or to be, build this or build that. He says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. That's why he came. He understood that's why he was teaching. That's why he was demonstrating. That's why he was healing. But ultimately, there would be a purpose of fulfillment in his life here on this earth, in this body. Jesus was not distracted and unfocused by anything. He stayed focused on his purpose. Number one, he knew the time in which he was. It's interesting there in verse 51, if you still have your Bibles open, verse 51. It says, when the time came for his ascension, he was going to Jerusalem. Did you catch that? It would be really easy to go, okay, when the time came for him to be crucified, he was going to Jerusalem. But it skips right over that, doesn't it? It says, when the time came for him to go to be ascend, to do the ascension, to ascend back into heaven, he was going to go to Jerusalem. It's like, wait a minute. What about the crucifixion? What about the tomb? But, the, but, the, but Luke bypasses over that. And that's a big lesson for us is because we've got to know the time in which you are living right now. The time in which we are living right now is the time of preparation for our ascension. Yeah, there's going to be some crucifixions along the way. What did Paul say? I crucify my flesh daily. Yeah, I discipline myself daily. There's going to be pain and discomfort and all of those things, but what is the purpose for our ascension with Christ? We do not go to heaven because we become good people. We become good people because God has saved us for eternity with him in heaven. And so time, Jesus understood the time in which we, he is living. And the time in which we are living is the time of ministry and service right now. Our time to reach this community with the gospel of Jesus Christ is now. We can always put it off till later. Say, well, you know, when we, when we have this or we do that or we can do this or whatever, when we can buy this, when we can afford that, when we have the building paid off, then we'll really, no, no, no. The time is now for us to reach this community for Christ. We have no power to save this community, but we have the power to reach this community, and it is right now. You probably right now, some of you are remembering uh, what Jesus said. He says, you know what? We cannot say four months and then the harvest. He said, look to the fields. They're white to harvest right now. He said, there are people's souls that are ready for salvation right now, and we can't put it off four months. We've got to be involved right now. So he understood the time that he was in. He knew the time for his departure was soon, and therefore he knew the time for his Three days in the tomb was soon, and his crucifixion was soon, but he was going to Jerusalem, according to what Luke was saying, because he knew the time of ascension was near. The second thing is that he displayed resoluteness. It's not only that he was resolute, but he displayed resoluteness. Now, we don't really know how that happened. We don't really know the ramifications of that and, and all, but what we do know is this. Jesus was resolute to go to Jerusalem and the Samaritans sensed that, they could see that, and it offended them. Now, we, you, we can speculate all day long. It's kind of a waste of time. All we know is this, that he was resolute, and it was something that was visible. There was a display. The people did not welcome him because he was resolute. It's okay if everyone does not like you. It's okay if people see you and they go, man, that person is on mission. That person has a purpose. And I don't really like that. You know, that's okay. It's okay if everyone doesn't like you. It's okay if everyone doesn't believe you. It is okay if everyone doesn't follow you. But what is important is that you and I follow Jesus. That's what's important. 
because that is where we fulfill our greatest purpose and we walk in step with his spirit. It is okay if someone actually persecutes you or makes fun of you or laughs at you or throws fake snowballs and shoots Nerf arrows at you. It is okay if those things happen. Are they comfortable? No. Are they convenient? No. Do we like it? I hope not, but it's okay. It's okay if somebody does whatever, you're focused. The grace of God is working in you to keep you focused, to say, I am gonna serve God with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength. The third thing is that Jesus was filled with love. You look there in verse number 55, it says, Jesus turned and rebuked his disciples, not the Samaritans. Does anyone else think that's funny? It's like the Samaritans are like all upset, and I think Jesus could have said, really? I've done nothing but good, and you're offended? But he turns and rebukes his disciples. Why? They were the ones that needed rebuking. Jesus demonstrated his love for the Samaritans by forgiving them without a conversation. And he also demonstrated his love for his disciples by rebuking them. It was love in both conditions. He was saying, I want you to know, I forgive you. We, we don't even need to talk about it. It's done. Don't worry about it. But he also has times when he loves us by saying, hey, dude, you're wrong. You're distracted. You're not doing what you're supposed to do. Come on, let's go. I've got better plans for you than that. You're getting distracted. You're getting off course. Your arrow is going to go in the wrong direction, and that's not good. Thank God we have no sheetrock repair to do this week. <laughs> He's saying, don't, don't, don't send your arrow in the wrong direction. That always harms people. People who are distracted have a tendency to hurt people, and hurt people hurt people. He forgave the Samaritans. He forgave his own disciples because he recognized, he knew, he lived, he was, he is the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. So God is saying, I've got you on task. I've got you on purpose. Don't get distracted. Now here the temptation is to say, you're right, Chris. I, I've got to man up. I've really got to... I gotta boister myself and I've gotta become more determined. Well, yeah, yeah, I think that's a good plan. But I would submit to you today, you're gonna fail. Just as I have failed and would fail and will fail, if all I'm depending on is my determination, I've, I've gotta do better. Yeah, that's great. But how do we become resolute? How do we live a life of resoluteness and resilience and not being distracted. It is not by our self-determination. It is by the grace of God working in us. It starts when we recognize the fact that in our past we have sinned. The Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all messed up. And so if we come to God and say, God, I, man, I need your forgiveness for the sins that I've committed. I've, I've offended you when I've lied. I have offended you when I've stolen. I've offended you when I've offended one of your children. I've offended you. And God, I am sorry. Please forgive me. You know, God always answers that prayer. He goes, yes, yes, that's the prayer I've been listening for and waiting for and wanting. Yes, I forgive you. And immediately the grace of God comes over us and he showers us with his love, his forgiveness. And here's the cool thing God says. He takes our sin and it's, I just, I just kind of picture him crumpling it up like a, like a piece of paper. And he throws our sin as far as the east is from the west. Man, that's powerful, isn't it? He just says, I'm removing your sin from you. It's not just that I'm just going to kind of not look at it anymore. He says, I am removing your sin from you. And what do we see in that moment? It's like we just have a, we have a clean slate. You know, we just have a clean slate. I think that term clean slate came from those old times when students used to have a chalkboard to do their schoolwork on. No, I did not have one. I'm not that old but I hear that every kid had a little chalkboard and they'd use, and then they'd do a clean slate, they'd erase it. 
and they do a clean slate. Of course, today it'd be a dry, dry erase marker board, right? Yeah, a clean slate. He says, all that, all that sin that was accounted to you because you did it, he says, I just wiped it clean. And that's powerful, isn't it? He says, I have wiped it clean. But if you're like me, since that day when God took my slate and he wiped it clean, I made some mistakes. I've sinned. I did things that were wrong. But you know what God does? Every time we come to him and say, God, I did it again. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. He goes, yeah. And he wipes it clean. Then he says, that's how I want you to live. Just say, God, I'm sorry. And he wipes the slate clean. It is by his grace that we're forgiven. It is by his grace that we have love. It is by his grace that we can stay on task and do the purpose that he's given us to do. All of these distractions, all of this stuff that hits us, it's going to bounce off of us. Why? Because we're children of the Most High God. All this stuff that people will unleash on you, all of the tricks of the devil will bounce off of you. Why? Because you're a child of the Most High God. He has given us this wonderful weaponry, this armor of God, this belt of truth, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. The one that's really, really cool is that shield of faith. You know what it does? The Bible says that shield of faith quenches all the fiery darts of the enemy. You see, when the devil shoots darts at you, it's not just a, an arrow, though that would be bad enough, but he actually lights those puppies on fire. It's like a flaming arrow. It's, it's like something that's going to burn. And he says, if he can stick that arrow in you, boy, this, it's going to have an effect. But Jesus says the shield of faith quenches that fiery dart of the enemy. Who gives you faith? God does. God blesses you with the faith that you need to live and to resist all of this stuff, all of this junk that the devil throws at you, all this junk that the world throws at you. He says, I've got it. I've got it. It is not by your resolve or my resolve that we stay on task, but it is by the grace of Almighty God. Band's going to come back up, and we're going to have a couple more songs. We changed up the order of today, and we're going to have some more time of worship because I want this opportunity for us to not only pray and seek God's love, His grace, and His forgiveness, but also to pray for one another for those very things. To where we come to God and we just say, God, okay, uh, I've been trying by, by my own strength, and I don't know why I keep failing, but Lord, I don't want to just try anymore. I want to receive your grace and let your grace work in me so that my resolve can work. It is your grace working in me, yes, with resolve, that I can be that resolute person. The Apostle Paul, I close with this, the Apostle Paul was strong and and. One, wonderful. He was not perfect, but he was amazing. And of course, he would uh, go into places and he would preach the gospel and start a church. And the, 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 uh, the statement is Paul would either uh, start a revival or a riot, and sometimes both, right? And many times he landed in prison. Many times he landed literally beaten up. Uh, one time, uh, they, they, they beat him so bad, they actually thought he was dead. They just kind of dragged him out onto the garbage heap and just left him. Um, there were times when, when he was just whipped on his back uh, 39 times. Incredible. And, 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 and when he was writing to the Philippians, he's in jail, and that meant in chains, literally chained to the wall or the floor or whatever. And he said this statement. He said, it has become evident to everyone that I am in chains for Christ. I'm in chains for Christ. We're, we're, we're talking about stuff, you know? We're talking about stuff. And we talk about things bouncing off of us because we're children of God. But let's, let's face the reality those, those things that get thrown at us can change the trajectory of our physical being. Our relationships. We can understand, wait a minute. If God allows something to hit me, God allowed it to hit me. 
my purpose doesn't change. The grace of God doesn't change because he gives me grace to endure. God gave Paul grace to endure being beaten, whipped, shipwrecked, left for dead, and in prison and in chains. He gave him the grace to do that. And he gives you the same grace. He gives you the same grace to say, man, I got knocked off course. I got fired from my job. What is going on with this, God? You said you were gonna bless me and then I get fired. Wait a minute. If God allowed it, then God allowed it. He's gonna give you the grace. But his purpose hasn't changed. The grace hasn't changed. What did Paul do while he was in prison? He just said, I think the Holy Spirit's telling me to write a couple of these churches that I started and these people that I've been ministering to. And he starts writing these Holy Spirit inspired letters. Now we call it much of the New Testament. So though he was in chains, literal chains, he said, my purpose hasn't changed. I'm not gonna get knocked off course because the grace of God is still working in me. And I would say to you, the grace of God is still working in you. You weren't planning on that divorce, but the grace of God is still working in you. You had no idea that child was gonna go haywire, but the grace of God is still working in you. You didn't know you were gonna get fired. You didn't know you're gonna have to go through a bankruptcy. You didn't know whatever, but the grace of God is still working in you because God doesn't change. But he has a way of adjusting our lives and testing us so that what is inside can come out and he can deal with it. And then we become more like Christ. And that's his goal. And that is our goal as believers in Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me, please? And we want to take this time of worship and praise and prayer. And um, for those of you on this side, you've got a clean, clear path uh, to the front. Those of you on this side not so clean and clear, which is a good reminder that stuff happens. Hello? Stuff happens. Sometimes you gotta, you gotta meander through some stuff, but God is good. Amen? God is good. You're here today and you're saying, you know what, wow, I, I've always kind of thought that serving God was about do the right thing and you, but you're talking to me about God's grace and his forgiveness. And that if I come to him and just say, God, would you please forgive me of my sin? He will. I would say, yes, he will. He will. God loves to answer that prayer. God, please forgive me. He loves that. Jesus Christ died on the cross for the sins of the whole world. That means mine and yours. Everything we've done that is in violation of him, of God. He paid for that sin. He paid for it. Now, I don't know about y'all. I got spankings when I was a kid. Real live spankings. It's just kind of, God took the spanking for you or the timeout or whatever, you know, you had. God took the spanking for you. And it's much more than a spanking or a timeout. It's the difference between an eternity with God and eternity separated from God. Amen. That's the distance change. And so will you accept what God's done for you? Will you accept what Jesus did on the cross for you? He paid the price for your sin and my sin and the sin of the whole world. But yet it's kind of like a check. If somebody gives you a check, you got to cash it. And so today I'm asking you cash the check. God has given you a check called forgiveness. He signed it in his blood. Jesus signed in red. He says, this check is for the forgiveness of all of your sin. Now you got to cash the check. And that's when you just say, God, I'm cashing the check. I'm asking you, please forgive me. And I accept the forgiveness of Jesus. Man, then it's a done deal. Then it's a done deal. Will you do that today? Will you pray that prayer? Would you say, God, please, Lord, please forgive me of my sin. Please, Lord, I, I've, I've done things wrong. Please forgive me. I want to be clean before you. People might not like me. People might like me. But, Lord, I want you to accept me. And so, Lord, I accept your forgiveness of all of my sin. Please, Lord God, lead me and guide me in my life. I want to love you. I want to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, Lord, I receive your forgiveness. 
I receive your grace. I receive your goodness because, Lord, you are good. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.